And over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the Holy Spirit. In fact, last two weeks, we have been looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. We identified that the Holy Spirit was responsible for birthing the church or giving birth to the church. That's his responsibility, that the church was born as a result of the Spirit of God. Amen? We say that on the day of Pentecost, that was the day that the church was actually birthed. That was the starting point of the church of Jesus Christ. After Christ died, he rose, he ascended into heaven, and he left the church so that we as a people can be together. The word church means ecclesia. In fact, the Greek word is ecclesia. It's a called out body, a body that has been called out. We have been called out of the world to be gathered together in one accord, with one spirit, with one mind. Amen? So we have been looking at the work of the church, of the Holy Spirit in the church. And today we want to continue on, along a path, this path, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And today we're looking at the teacher, the teacher, the Holy Spirit as the teacher of truth. The teacher of what? The Holy Spirit as the teacher of truth. Remember we said that the work of the Holy Spirit was birthing, teaching, and keeping. So we looked at the birthing of the church, and now we are looking at the work that he does teaching the church, teaching us. And uh, we, so that this morning we, we want to get into that. Uh, let's go to our main text, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And we're going to pick it up from verse 13. When you have it, say amen. amen. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So we see here that Jesus is speaking, and he's saying that the Holy Spirit is going to come, and he has identified the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of what? The Spirit of truth. And he says, for he shall speak not of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So we see here that this Holy Spirit is going to be a guide. Say guide. That's what he says, right? He will, uh, how be it, the spirit of truth is going to come, and he will guide you into all truth. He's going to do what? Guide you into all truth. He's going to guide us as the church into all truth. One of the things that I have seen over the years is that the Holy Spirit actually comes into our lives to give us guidance, to give us direction. When we talk about the word guide, the word guide here in this context actually means to teach. It means to, to show the way, to point the direction. It gives an understanding as to it gives an understanding as to the direction that an individual is supposed to go, to instruct, to show the way. So the Holy Spirit has been assigned not only to give birth to the church, but also for us as the church to be guided into something. Into what? Into truth. All truth. Excellent. So now, if I was to... Can I borrow my wife just for a moment, please? So now, if I was the Holy Spirit and she was the church, the responsibility for the Holy Spirit to the church is to guide the church. So can you hold my hand? Right. So that he comes alongside us and he takes us into a particular path. And that path is what we call the truth. So he guides us into the path that we should go. He guides us. So he walks alongside us, showing us or teaching us. So now he's not just pointing the way per se, but as he goes with us, it is instructions that are given so that we can know exactly what is the truth. So that as we go, there's instructions that are guiding us. There's teachings that is actually telling us that this is where we ought to go. This is where we're not to go. And this is where what we ought to do. 
or this is what we ought not to do. Thank you, my love. So that the Holy Spirit goes with us. It goes with us. And he teaches us as we go. And I think that's an amazing thing. Because Jesus says he's not going to leave us comfortless. Because remember, when Christ walked the face of the earth, he was the teacher. He was the one who taught his disciples. So now he was leaving, and he was leaving now the Holy Spirit to continue the job that he started in terms of guiding the disciples onto the way of truth. So now as he was leaving, he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit is going to guide you. Now, he has appointed this principal teacher of the church. He was, given, he was given to the disciples, and now he has given the disciples this Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of? Turn with me to John 14, 26. You see him mentioned there as well. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall what? Teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the same Holy Spirit that has been appointed to guide them, he's telling them it's a little more specific here. He's saying that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you two things in particular. What are the two, two things that he says that he's going to teach them? All truth, and then he's going to do what? Bring them into remembrance of the things that I have said. So what he's saying is this, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to guide you. He's going to teach you all things, all truth. And then he's going to also bring you into remembrance of what I have said. This is important. Take note of that. Because the Holy Spirit is going to teach you and he's going to bring to remembrance. He's going to do what? Bring to the remembrance what I have taught you. So the things that I have been teaching you now, the Holy Spirit is going to bring that to your remembrance. And he's going to bring you into the knowledge of truth. Truth here specifically and mainly speaks of the redemptive truth of God. What is it? That's a big theological term. So it's about the redemptive plan of God. How is it that man is to be saved? You see, there are lots of different religious ideologies and thoughts and philosophies as to how salvation can come. But there is one truth as it pertains to salvation. There is one way that man can be saved, and that's through Christ Jesus. And what we have to understand is that when the Holy Spirit has come, he's going to teach us this way of salvation. He's not going to come to you teaching you some other way or some other path to God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. So that when the Holy Spirit is coming, he's coming to teach us the path to salvation. That's the truth. This is the redemptive plan of God. When man was, was made, man was made perfect, he was made sinless, and God put him in the garden, then all of a sudden man listened to the devil. He was deceived. Well, really, the Bible says the woman was deceived. Ouch, somebody said. But, but man fell. But God had a plan. And the plan is this, that even though man fell, God still loved man. And his plan was to redeem man. And what God did, he gave himself, he gave his son Jesus Christ to die so that we can have this life being redeemed. We can have now this relationship with God being restored. So that that which we lost in the fall, that which we lost in the Garden of Eden, that which caused us to, to, to be corrupt in our thinking, to be corrupt in our life, that which causes us to sin continually, that God came in now and he sacrificed his son so that we no longer have to be under that bondage to sin. We can receive forgiveness of our sins. And come into a relationship with God. 
once again. And as we said last day, that the Holy Spirit now, once we have come into this relationship with God, and it's the Holy Spirit who brings that reality to us. He is the one who tells us that we can have a relationship with Christ. First of all, he is the one who tells us that we're wrong and we need to be set right. And as we allow him to come into our lives, brothers and sisters, he shows up and he confirms with us now that we have been redeemed. So much so that he causes us on the inside to be able to cry out something different instead of where we, where, where we used to be crying out before and saying um, creator or God or saying that there is some God and knowing that there is some right now based on our relationship with God through his Holy Spirit we can say Abba we can say Father so he teaches us that way he brings us into that redemptive plan of God and teaches us the way of salvation. Amen? He's called the spirit of truth. What is he called? Because that's his nature. Why is it that he's called the spirit of truth? Because that's his nature. Remember, he's the spirit of God. And over the uh, when we first started the series, we looked at the person of the Holy Spirit and we said that the Holy Spirit is God. It's the spirit of God. And what we're saying is that God is truth. So that when we talk about the spirit of truth, we are talking about him being as his spirit that comes. That's the nature of the spirit of God. Just like how Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is truth. So that the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Christ, is what we have now. The nature, his nature is one of truth. There's a gentleman by the name of Matthew Paul. He's one of those Bible commentators. He says that the Spirit of God has come to guide as a guide of the way, or guide to the way. Not to discover truth as an object of understanding, but the bowing of the will to the obedience to it. I'm going to break down that. Let's dismantle that a bit. He says that the truth, that our, our guide that is given us, that has been given, to lead us to truth is not just an object of our understanding. So when we talk about being guided to the truth, it is more than just us receiving understanding as to what God is saying. It goes beyond just that. It takes us to a place of being able to be submitted to this truth that we have been exposed to and that we now understand. Because it's one thing to understand truth. But there is a different thing entirely to be subjected or to be submitted to the truth. If I tell you something and you know this to be true, but you resist what I have said, your knowledge of the truth is of no consequence. What happens is this. That the truth that has been revealed to us must promote change in our lives. And that's what God has taken us to. So the Holy Spirit has come to guide us to the truth or guide us to the truth. It's not just to bring us to an understanding of what God is saying. But it's to impact our lives so that we can live the truth. Not just hear it. You see, the truth of God's word is more than just for academic knowledge. That's not about it. And that's why there are many, and you're going to be surprised to hear this, but there are many Bible theologians who don't even believe in God, even though they have Bible doctorate in theology. They don't even believe in God even though they have been exposed to all this truth. And what we are saying is this, that when the Holy Spirit teaches us now, he teaches us not only what to know, but how to do that which we know. And this is what is important for us to be able to do, brothers and sisters. How do we apply the truth? And I think that's why somebody asked the question, you can't handle the truth. 
Amen? So the truth is important. How important is the truth to the church of Jesus Christ? So let's look at it. First Timothy chapter 3. When you have it, say amen. We're going to read 14 and 15. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, of the truth. He says here, Paul is telling Timothy, he's saying that I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you very soon, but just in case I don't come, so that you can know, that you can know how to behave yourself where? How to behave yourself where? In the house of God. So he's saying to us that there's a way that we ought to behave in God's house. That's an ouch moment, isn't it? So that there's a way that we ought to conduct ourselves. And let me add this, that the house of God is not just this building, but the house of God is the church. In fact, he went on to say it's the church of the living God, not the church of a dead God. The church of the living God. And what he's saying is this, that there's a way to carry about yourself as a believer. There's a way to carry about yourself as the church. There's a way to conduct your life. And this is why I've been writing to you. That you may know how to, and hear the word, behave. Many times I ask, you know, I talk to somebody on the phone, I call them and say, you behave in yourself? Because we need to know how to behave. Some people have some bad behavior. Some people, naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> Not so? If you can say amen, say ouch. But he's telling us that he's giving us instructions. He tell you, we write all of this so that we can know how to behave. In the house of God. Which is the church of the living God. And then he goes on to say, the pillar and the ground of truth. And that simply means, brothers and sisters, now a pillar is a, a big column that holds up a structure, not so? It gives support to a structure. That's what a pillar does. So that when we think about this pillar, we are thinking about something that is strong enough, something that is solid something that can uphold. So we are saying that the church is to uphold the truth. The, 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 the church is to support the truth. Truth can lean on the church. So that this building has to have pillars to keep it up. And what we are saying is that from the scripture, we are understanding the church has been given the responsibility to uphold the truth. He also says it's not just the pillar of truth, but he says it's the pillar and ground of truth. And that word ground is foundation. So that we are getting the concept of some sort of architecture here. So that there is the pillar and then there is the foundation. And a foundation makes things secure. It stabilizes. So that if you don't have a good foundation, the building comes down. I wonder if you get what I'm saying this morning. So which means the assignment of the church is to be that stable ground upon which truth can rest. The objective of the church is to be able to support the truth of God's word. 
so that when we compromise the truth, we cease from being the church of God. When we don't present, when we don't uphold the truth, Because the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of truth. So that if truth cannot be found in the church, then that is not the church. So the church of the living God has to present the truth of God's word. And in this context, we understand that truth has to now form the basis of our behavior and our conduct. Because that's what he says. I have written to you in such a way so that you can know how to behave where? In the church of the living God, not the church of the dead God. This is not a church of some mercy. This is not some, some sort of, this is not um, all, these, all these false gods and all these ancient gods and all the Egyptian gods and all the Roman gods. This is not the church for that. This is the church of the living God. So that we need to know that as the church of the living God, there's ways to behave that displays truth in our lives. We need to see truth. Truth is visible. And what he is saying is this, that the church got to display it. When God gave birth to the church, the purpose for the church is to extend the ministry of Christ in the earth. And this is why the Holy Spirit has been given to empower the church, to bring the church into an understanding as to what truth is. Because if we have to continue the ministry of Christ in the earth, then we got to go with the same spirit that Christ had when he walked the face of the earth. And this is why he said to them, don't do anything as yet. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Wait for the promise of the Father. And when you receive the promise, then and only then you can be a witness unto me. Why? Because you need the spirit of truth to speak the true witness of who Christ is. Without the spirit of truth, brothers and sisters, we have error. Without the spirit of truth, we are in error. The only antidote to error the only antidote to false doctrine is the truth and this is why it's important for us to have the spirit of truth to teach us to do what? to teach us what? to teach us all truth so it's important for us to understand that so the revealed truth of God and God's redemptive plan has been entrusted to the church. And the church now has an awesome responsibility. What's our responsibility? One, to preserve the truth. To do what? In purity. So we are not to allow there to be a contamination of the truth. Now this is frightening because of the fact that where we stand now in history... Is at a point at which truth has already been contaminated. It's at a point where a lot of religious ideologies have infiltrated the church and has allowed there to be a different concept as to what is the message of Christ Jesus. So you have different religions within Christendom spread, spreading different gospels. You even have a religion that under cover of their book has another gospel of Jesus Christ. And the word of God tells us if anybody comes preaching another gospel, count that one as a heretic. But they are called the church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. But on their book, another gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. 
So we have to preserve this truth. We have to get back to, as I said last week, the doctrine that the apostles taught. Because that's what they received from Christ. So that if we can get back to what they taught, we're going to be closer to what Christ taught. But if we allow just traditions and culture to inform our theology, we're going to be in problems. Because that's what is happening in our society today. Tradition and culture is what is informing our theology. Now, both of them are not wrong in itself. There's nothing entirely wrong with traditions in as much as it does not contradict the word of God. For example, there's a tradition that we would take communion. Not so. That's a tradition. But the word of God says, as often as we do it, do it in remembrance of him. So that while it's a tradition, it does not contravene the word of God. In fact, it's a tradition that came out of the word of God. And it was done, it was practiced by the early church. And so we continue it now. There are things within our culture today that are totally against God's word. And it now becomes acceptable to the church. It now becomes acceptable to who's supposed to be the people of God. So that we do things now. So for example, you find in churches in the U.S. and in several parts of America, homosexuality and lesbianism is no big thing. And of course, the, the thing that goes with it or the, the scripture that goes with it is that we ought not to judge. And that Jesus, when the woman was caught in adultery, Jesus told her, you know, um, told the people rather, who were about to condemn her, they, said, they say that Jesus said to them, to that, those people, he that is without sin cast the first stone. So that because all of us are sinners... We shouldn't be judging anybody who may have that type of lifestyle. That type of what? So that, so that it becomes acceptable. It becomes part of the norm now. Because the culture of today has accepted it. And it's wrong. And what we are saying is that we cannot allow ourselves to be guided by the culture. We have to be guided by the word of God, amen? And if the church is the pillar and the foundation of truth, if the church has to be the pillar and that foundation that supports the truth, that, gives, that, that actually allows the truth to be manifested in our earth today, then we need to hold to the word of God, amen? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Can you read for me, please? 24 to 27, after 4. Three, four. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was, it, and great was the fall of it. Here Jesus is saying that, I have spoken to you certain words, and I will continue to teach you. But he that hears my words, he is that he that receives these teachings and do them. I am going to be I am going to liken him unto a man that builds his house on a what? On a foundation. On a rock. Pressure will come. 
winds will blow against it. Rains will come and beat upon it. But you're going to stand. Why? There's a foundation. But if we don't have a foundation, when these challenges come, and you see what's important for us to know is that in spite of how you build your house, you're going to face the same elements. Correct? If you put up your house and you decide that you're just screening the floor and you're just putting up walls and you ain't studying about any foundation and your neighbor dig a deep foundation and put up a massive house, both of you are going to face the same elements. When rain fall here, it go fall next door too. You understand? When the wind blowing, it blowing here and it blowing there. If it have earthquake, earthquake shaking here and it's shaking here too. The point we're making is this, that based on your foundation, that's going to determine whether you stand or you don't stand. And what we're saying, brothers and sisters, is that the foundation that we must have is Christ's word. And this is why when the Holy Spirit comes, remember what I said. He teaches you two things. What's the two things? The truth and he brings you into remembrance of what? What I have said. So that we need to grasp what Christ has been teaching because that's what we got to stand on. All the traditions and whatever is good, you can deal with that. But don't neglect the words that Christ has been teaching us. Don't neglect it. There is a foundation that we got to stand on. And he says, when the winds come, when the rains come, when the wind beats upon it, guess what? You're going to stand only if you have the right foundation. And that's why the Spirit of God will bring to remembrance that which Christ has been saying. So that he's going to cause us to remember, hey, the Lord said this. He's going to cause us to remember that Christ has been teaching this. And this is why I tell people, let's get into God's word so that we can know. You see, you can only bring to remembrance that which you have Known. All of you understand what I'm saying to you. Do you remember Gregory? You know A. Gregory? Do you know Gregory Grant? So you don't remember him? What about you? She remember him. Why? Because she knew him. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying. Do you remember Dr. Keith Rowley? You remember him? How do you remember him? Yeah? You know him. I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. If you have not been exposed to something, you can't remember that. I wonder if you get what I'm saying. If you have not been exposed to something, you can't, it can't come back to your remembrance. So what we have to do is to be exposed to God's word. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He takes now that which we have been reading, that which we have been understanding, that which we have been exposed to, and he now brings enlightenment to it. So when you're in a pressure time, he brings to remembrance that which you have to learn. That's why when Jesus, when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil, he was able to say, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God was able to bring to remembrance that which he has learned. And this is why we as believers, we need to spend time in the word of God because it, the, the psalmist David says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. So that when we have the word of God hidden in our heart and temptation comes, we can use the word to stand and not fall. Why? We have a foundation. 
The challenge that we have, brothers and sisters, is many of us not getting into the wood. But that's what God uses to help keep us. And that's why the enemy will flog you day in and day out so that every time you try to read the word, he comes, rock by baby on the street. Up. And he's doing it quick, 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 you know. Because as soon as you open the Bible, you start to fall asleep because he knows if you only get familiar with the word, he lose his battle. That's, the, that's what happens. He knows that if you only get into the word, you're going to have something to remember. The Holy Spirit will have something to work with to bring to your remembrance what Christ has said. And that is why he will try to shut up that word. And that's why the prophets say, he ain't waiting just for the written word. He said, thy word have I hid in my heart. I think it was Isaiah or Jeremiah, one of them says, that the word is like fire in my bones. It becomes part of me. And that's what it has to happen. We have to get this word so much in us, brothers and sisters, that when we are walking, we are walking in a foundation. You're waiting just till you come to church to get your foundation. You are the church. So wherever you go, you've got to be that foundation and that pillar. I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. You see, the challenge, brothers and sisters, is that we are thinking that we've got to go somewhere to get that which God has for us. But the word is important. Tell your neighbor the word. Get into the word. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, read it for me please. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins good about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. The what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Here Paul is saying that we have a battle that we got to face. That there is a fight that we are in. And he's saying that you got to equip yourself effectively with the tools that are necessary to win. And he says that you got to put on part of the armor. What's that? So it's not just part of the armor. So he says, put on the what? Whole armor. And he starts with your loins, get about with what? Oh my gosh. So first of all, he says, you see your loin area? Make sure you have truthfulness there. Ouch! Your breastplate. Make sure that your heart is protected with what? Righteousness. Have on the helmet of salvation. Have on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. Get for your shield, the shield of faith, because with faith you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And then he said something. He said, taking the sword of the spirit and he says which is 
the word of God. Of all the, the elements of the armor, every single one of them is defensive. Every one of them. Helmet, breastplate, your loins girded with truth, your boots on your foot, your shield. All of that is defensive. But you have a sword. And this is an offensive, defensive weapon. And he says, when you have the sword of the spirit. And look what he says. It's the sword of what? The spirit. So that the spirit is that producer of this sword. That you can now fight with. All the others is for you to defend yourself. But this one, you hit it, you hit it. I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. When you have this word in your heart and the enemy comes against you, it's this you're using against him. I wonder if you get what I'm saying. It's not that I saved 20 years now, you know. You can't come and test me. You're the devil. I know better than you. I know when you come and I know what you look like. And that have absolutely no consequence against the enemy. I wonder if you understand what we have is the word of God. Even Christ Jesus, he was the living word. And when the enemy come against him, he used the written word, that which he understood, that which he studied. It is written. You see, brothers and sisters, this is what God has allowed the Holy Spirit to inscribe upon our hearts. So that when we face, you can't wait till you get in an attack from the enemy and you're saying, oh, um, wait, wait, where is it now? Um, 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 wait, 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 um, there's no better enemy. There's no, hold on. There's like a fella, he, you know, he have a gun, a, a, a gun packing or something like that. And he don't know how to use it. So when somebody comes, he say, hold on, hold on, hold on. And he goes, and he's trembling and he, and he's trying to pack. The, he don't get shot. He can't get it. What we have to understand, brothers and sisters, is God has given us the sword of the Spirit. And it's the Word of God. So we cannot allow ourselves to go through this life without understanding what the Word of God is saying to us and how it can apply to our lives. The Spirit of God has given us this Word. When you look at second. Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by? That word inspiration means God breathed. So God inspired. So all scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. And is? It's not unprofitable. This, and now this profitable does not mean that you will make money from it. <laughs> I know some people love that part of the verse that is profitable. But it's profitable for what? What does the word doctrine mean? Teaching. So it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, so that it brings conviction to us, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. So that this scripture that the Spirit of God has caused men to write, it's profitable. This is where we get our teaching from. This is where we get our reproof from. This is where we get our correction from. This is where we get our instructions in righteousness. So we don't get instructions in righteousness from the culture. We can't expect other people who don't know God to teach us what righteousness of God is. We got to understand that. And he says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that if the man of God can hold to this, he will be mature, he will be perfected, thoroughly furnished in all good works. The scriptures, brothers and sisters, is essential for us because the Holy Spirit has used this to give us an understanding as to who God is. It used this, 
the scriptures to give us an understanding of who we are and who we are in Christ Jesus. A lot of times when we talk about the Holy Spirit, people like to depend on a wonderful experience. And you know, we go to where Paul spoke about him being caught up into the third heavens and, and I want to be caught up in the third heavens like Paul and I want to do this. And, and let me tell you something. We cannot allow even our experiences to come before the scripture. I wonder if you get what I'm saying. You can have wonderful, nice experience, supposedly be with God, but that must not dominate your life. So you can't now build a doctrine or build your belief or build your faith only based on some experience that you have. Whether it is that you experience an angel, whether you experience a, a vision, whether you experience a dream. You know, some people say, I get a dream and the Lord tell me this. And then you see that they disappear and then you don't see them again. You see them, some kind of queer spooky things happen. Your experiences cannot determine doctrine. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 16. When you have it, say amen. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we, for he received, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. What did he say? We heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of what? Prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is a powerful scripture, isn't it? Now let's put this into context. Peter here, remember Peter was one of the disciples of Christ. In fact, he was one of the Three closest disciples to Christ. There was Peter, James, and John, who was referred to as Jesus' inner circle. And there was a time where Jesus was transfigured. This was what is referred to as the transfiguration, where he went up to the mountain, and as he was up there in the mountain, his, his whole form changed. It was like if there was a, a big glow, he was like light, and, and there was this magnificent experience that Peter, James, and John witnessed. And he heard from the heavens while they were there. They heard the heavens from the heavens, the voice of God saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. This is the experience. Peter was talking about. Isn't that a marvelous experience? That's remarkable. There are very few people on the face of this earth who would have experienced anything like that, where they saw the glory of Christ. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. But in spite of that, look at what the scriptures are saying here. Peter himself is saying, that in spite of the fact that I have seen this, in spite of the fact that I heard the voice of God, we have a more sure word of prophecy. 
there is something more certain than my personal experience. There is something more real than my personal experience. Even though what I have experienced was so awesome, there is a more sure word of prophecy. And it's important for us, brothers and sisters, to take note of that. Because despite what we experience, and I'm quite certain that many of us are not going to have an experience like Peter. <laughs> In spite of that, Peter was able to recognize that there is something more solid. There is something more certain. There is something more stable that I can depend on. You see, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well. You do well that it take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark places. And this is what he's saying here. Take heed to the scriptures that are written. He went on to say, lest we think that is just the prophetic utterance. Because somebody may say this and say, okay, well, so it's just the prophetic. So we have the more sure word of prophecy. So when I speak the word of the prophet, when you hear that, that, that's, that's the gospel truth. He clarified it. Knowing this, that no prophecy of what? Scripture. No prophecy of what? Is of any private interpretation. So don't come and tell me that you have this personal revelation that nobody else in the world see before. The reason why nobody else in the world see it because it wasn't there. It's not no revelation from God. We have to be very careful with that. When somebody comes with this new, this new doctrine and this new prophecy and this new thing. He says, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. You can't just sit on in yourself and say, oh, so this is what that means. And it's so totally away from every standard um, biblical understanding of it. No, 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 no. The word. We've got to depend on the word. Amen? Amen. Tell anybody the word. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. From verse 10. I want you to see this. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming there, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. How did they receive the word? With all readiness of mind. And searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Look what it did. They received the word with readiness of mind. This is Paul and Silas preaching. I don't know if you get this. Paul and Silas is preaching to the saints in, in Berea. And now they who were there, they were noble. They were upright men. They received the word that they preached with all readiness. But guess what? They searched the scriptures daily to make sure that that which Paul and Silas was preaching is in line with God's word. I wonder if you get what I'm saying. They search the scriptures daily to make sure that that which the apostle Paul, who? I mean, if it's Paul preaching, we had to take that. That is gospel truth, not so? Not for the Berean saints. Not so. No matter who come preaching, I got to test this. I got to try this. Because that's what the word of God tells me to do. Try every spirit. Prove all things. And hold fast to that which is good. 
You see, what happened is that as they were going through, brothers and sisters, they needed to confirm that this what is being preached is indeed in line with God's word. Why? Because that's what we got to stand on. But our church of today, our postmodern church has become, and this is not a condemnation of you, but this is the truth. We have become a little lazy as a church. Isn't that not the truth? So we just wait for somebody to say something, and then we hold on to it. And it sounds nice. And we hold on to whether it sounds nice or it don't sound nice. You see, if that preacher sounds like he knows what he's talking about, then it's truth. And if he sounds like he ain't know what he's talking about, nah, he ain't telling the truth. But that's not the test. The test is what? The scriptures. So that no matter what people say, we got to go back to the scriptures to see if it is that that which it says is in line with sound doctrine. Because the challenge, brothers and sisters, is that this is a season of the deception. And the word of God says that in these last days, there will be deception. My God. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. What does it say? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Hear what he says. The Spirit speaketh. Who speaks? The Spirit of God is telling us that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. And what is going to cause them to depart? They will give heed. They will do what? To give heed means that they will pay attention to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? Devils. So that if we don't know the truth, we're going to be deceived by the seducing spirits and the doctrines or the teachings of devils. And that is one of the things that we are seeing in the, our church today. They are speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared as with a hot iron. Turn also with 1 John 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 as well. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Are we to believe every spirit? No. <laughs> Not everybody who come looking like church is church. Not everybody who come looking like a preacher is a preacher of God. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the not some, many, say many. Many false prophets have gone out in the world. And hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And then he goes on to say, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh is not of God. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. And it's not somebody anti that named Christ. Eh? So the Holy Spirit is there. To teach us. Holy Spirit is there to teach us the truth of God's word. And one of the things that he has done is he has altered the scriptures. So that we can have an understanding as to what is the truth. So this is how he speaks to us primarily. He also speaks to us internally. And I just want to spend a few moments... And looking at how he speaks to us internally, is that okay? First John, we st right there in First John, look at one page ahead um, before that, chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. So he's given us a warning. So he gave us the warning that we ought not to try every spirit. Paul told us, told Timothy, that. In the last days, the Spirit speaks that there are some who's going to come to seduce. Not so? Now look what we see here in 1 John 
First John chapter 2, verse 26 says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that what? These things I have written unto you concerning them that do what? Seduce you. And when we talk about seduce here, we're not talking about somebody who you're meeting at a bar and they try to seduce you. We're talking about those who come with contrary doctrine, false teachings, to captivate your mind and your heart, to draw you away from the things of God. That's the seduction that we're talking about. So he said, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the what? Oh my gosh. But the what? Anointing. Anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth, teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. So here he is saying this, that I'm giving you the warning that people will seduce you. But I have given you a solution. What's the solution? There is an anointing. A what? There is an anointing. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. Say anointing. Are you anointed by God? Most of us are. Go up to verse 20. Read verse 20 for me. You have a what? That's the same word, anointing. From whom? The Holy One. You see, brothers and sisters, when we receive the Holy Spirit, that's the anointing that we have been receiving. When you have the Holy Spirit come into your life, that's an anointing that has come into your life. I know some of us think that when we talk about the anointing, we're only thinking about pastor have the anointing, but not so. Guess what? Once you are in Christ Jesus, you have the anointing of God too. And the anointing that you receive actually causes you to do what? To know things. What's the things that he causes you to know? The truth. Because that's what combats the seduction. Go back down to verse 26 and 27. Look what he says here. So that... Verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. The anointing, that Holy Spirit that you have received of God, that Holy Spirit that you have received of Christ, that abides on the inside of you. And you don't need that anybody should teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. So what he is saying here is this. All right, let me first of all say what he is not saying. It does not mean that there is absolutely no teachers of God's word and that you don't need to have teachers of God's word because when you look at the context, he himself was teaching. Not so? And God has ordained teachers. What he is saying is this. That you don't need any seductive, deceptive, de de um, delusionary person to come and teach you. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So that you don't need anybody who has that spirit of seduction, that spirit of deception. You don't need them to come and teach you when you have the anointing of God on the inside of you to know what is right from what is wrong. So when somebody comes with deception, you cannot sit down and receive that. Because there is something on the inside of you, which we call the anointing of God, that rises up on the inside and says, this is not truth. Why? You have a foundation. That foundation was already laid. And the Holy Spirit works with that. 
and cries out. It's like a big alarm that goes on. Error, 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 error. I don't know if you get what I'm saying to us. So that when somebody comes with some deceptive word and they're trying to think and some kind of cultic practices and whatever as the case may be, you recognize that, hey, this is not of God. So what that man could come and teach me? What that woman could come and teach me? They have some people who are on the internet and they're teaching all kind of queer things. But you have to allow the spirit of God that is on the inside of you. And this is why we are teaching that you've got to know that the spirit of God is poured out on the inside of you. So that when you hear things that is coming as deception, you can reject it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has anointed you. And look what he says. This whole objective is for us to abide in Christ. For us to abide in him. That's what he says. Not so? You shall abide in him. So he's abiding in you, and you're abiding in him. That's the whole objective of Christ, leaving the Holy Spirit so that we can understand what it means to abide in Christ, the abiding presence of God on the inside of us, and we're abiding in him. That's what it's about. So this whole concept of the Holy Spirit teaching us brings us to the understanding, brothers and sisters, that there's an anointing on the inside of each one of us. And he now teaches us what God wants us to know about ourselves and what God wants us to know about God. I'll close with 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 9. But it is written, I hath not seen, nor ere heard, Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So here he's saying that even though our physical mind, our physical eye, our physical being, have not been able to understand what God has in store for us. None of us will be able to recognize just with our natural eyes what God has in store for you. Our eye has not seen it, nor ear heard. Neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Do you love God? Let me see your hands. How many of you all really love God? God has great things prepared for you, not so? But you do know. You don't know all that God has for you. And this is one of the reasons why, brothers and sisters, so many of us fall short of what God has in store because we don't know. And because we don't know, we think that God do have great things for us. We think that what we're going through in life now, that's the extent to which our life is. So for some of us, we're going through pressure, and we think that that's the end. For some of us, we're going through hardships, and we think that's it. That's all that God has for me. And some of us, we ask that, that is what God has for me? And the reality is this, that in our natural being, we don't know. He says, I have not seen Air has not heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. God is making preparation. In fact, he has made preparation for us who love God. But our natural man will not be able to understand and perceive it. But if it is, that we are in the spirit. And that's why he says, verse 10, but God, <laughs> but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. So what God has done is through his Holy Spirit, he has made known the things that he has prepared for us through his spirit. 
And when we look at the redemptive plan of God, the Spirit of God has altered the Bible so that we can know what is the redemptive plan of God. The future is already determined. For those who already have made that decision to love God and is living a life of a love relationship with God, there's a determined future. Because we love God. There's something that God has in store for us. And he says that we're going to be with him. That where he is, we will be also. Jump to verse 12, sorry. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us by, of God. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which, man, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of God that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So what we are seeing here, brothers and sisters, is that as we come into Christ and we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, he teaches us now our life that we got to live. The natural man doesn't understand these things. Those who are not in the spiritual aspect, who are not living a spiritual life, and when we talk about a spiritual life, we're not talking about just somebody who's doing yoga or this. We're talking about people who have accepted Christ and have allowed their spirit to be affected by the Spirit of God so much so that life comes from the inside. And what he's saying here is this, that as this life comes in now, we no longer just thinking from a natural perspective. There's a spiritual dimension. And the natural people, people who are just living a normal life, will not understand what we are talking about. And they will say, that what you're talking about is foolishness. Why? Because these things are spiritually discerned. The only way we can understand them is when the Holy Spirit teaches us these things. If the Holy Spirit is not allowed to teach us, we will not understand the things of God. And this is why there are so many people out there who do not know anything about God or anything significant about God because of the fact that they have not submitted themselves to Christ to allow the Holy Spirit to come into their life and start teaching them. So for Spiritual things, that's foolishness to them. They don't believe in God. They don't believe that there is a God. And the interesting thing is this, that they think that these things are foolish. But when they understand the truth of God's word, you recognize that it's a fool who says in their heart that there is no God. So we have to understand that even though people may not understand this that we are talking about, don't be surprised. All it means is that we need to tell them about Christ Jesus and share with them the importance of having the Spirit of God minister to their lives. When the Holy Spirit comes in, brothers and sisters, he starts to teach us so that we become a little more wise in our understanding. Not with the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that gives us direction for life. Every aspect of our lives needs to be directed by God. He guides us through his Holy Spirit. The word of God says that the spirit of, of truth is going to come to guide us into all truth. We have the spirit of truth. Let us don't turn to errors. Let's don't turn to deception. Let's don't give in to itching ears that, cause, that calls us out from the truth. But let us be rooted and planted in the truth. This is what the Holy Spirit has done for the church. He has come to teach us what is truth. Can you handle the truth?